are your ways, great are your words. He's never shocked. 
There's nothing that ever stresses him out. He is just in control. And I am thankful that he put it all together for this wonderful building, for this wonderful uh, church congregation, and the years of labor of the Talbot family. And we're here to celebrate with them tonight. And uh, I, I, I just want us to not get so caught up in the celebrating that we forget about the worshiping and magnifying God. That's what this building is going to be for. Amen? Amen. Let's worship the Lord in one prayer.
What an honor it is to be here with these wonderful, precious folks. Pastor and Sister Talbot are just precious, faithful people. Amen. And we love them dearly and so thankful to be here and be a part of this. Now, he, he made me MC and he told me I could do what I want to do. So, I want to do this. I want to receive an offering uh, for this local church. And I don't know, honestly, who all is here from this church. And I don't know who is guest here tonight besides the ones that came with me and a few other people that I know. But I think it would be really, really good if we just dug a little deep. Because they've had a lot of expenses in preparation for uh, this night. Putting this building together, fixing up a few things, getting it spruced up. And then uh, the, the expense of having this service tonight. And so we want to... We're going to help try to take care of that tonight. And when I say dig deep, I mean, I, I'm going to give all I have in the pocket. Okay? But we also, and I never receive an offering without letting you know that I'm not asking you to sacrifice if I'm not willing to sacrifice. And uh, the, the Apostolic Sanctuary is going to, going to contribute $100 to this offering tonight. And uh, I've not been asking anybody what you're going to give. It's, I wrote on, you know, it's between you and God. I just wanted you to know I'm not going to ask you to give sacrificially if we're not. Now, let me tell you this. If you didn't come prepared to give an offering, not an issue. Just put a little note in there and say, you can expect a check from such and such in the next few days, and it will spend just as well later this week as it would tomorrow. All right? So, now you can stand with me. And uh, here's the beauty. We don't have an usher, so I'm going to be the usher tonight. And uh, we're going to kind of do it the way we do it at home. Is that all right? Uh, we're going to march. Even if you're not going to give, just so you don't look like you know, you're not participating, you can march as well. Just don't take anything out of the offering plate. All right? So we want to give a good love, love offer to this church tonight. Will you help me out? Shout amen if you will. Lord, we love you and thank you for this opportunity to give to a worthy cause to help this local church as they further the gospel here in Creek Court. I pray your blessings upon the gift and the giver tonight in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. Amen. And they're going to come and lead us another worship course. You come and give. Giving you all.
seated. Sister Ann was going to get ready to minister the song. And while she's getting ready, I heard the story of a man that walked by this construction site. And uh, he spoke to the first man that he saw, and he asked him what he was doing. And he said, I'm laying bricks. He went on to another guy, and he looked at him and asked him, what are you doing? And uh, he, uh, he said, we're, we're, building a, we're building a building here. He went on to the third person and asked him what he was doing. He said, man, we are building a cathedral to God. Now, all three of them were at the same workplace. All three of them were doing the same thing. The difference between the one that was laying bricks and the one that was building the cathedral of God was a vision. And I am thankful that you have a pastor here that has a vision. Not to just be us four and no more and, and just be inclusive and, or uh, exclusive and just a few that are here. But has a vision to build a church for the glory of God in Creed 4. And I'm excited for God giving this wonderful edifice to this local assembly for them to be able to come and worship and build. And I just expect to continue to hear nothing but great reports as God continues to build his church here in this city. God bless you. You worship with my wife, and I don't know, it looks like Nathan may be going to sing with her as the, she ministers a song.
today. First of all, it's such an honor, as we have said, to be here tonight for this awesome occasion. And we're dedicating this building, this edifice, unto the Lord. It's also a, a certainly an honor to have our Illinois District Superintendent in service with us tonight. Amen. And uh, I came to this district about seven and a half years ago. I knew of him, but I am thankful that I had the opportunity to really get to know our district superintendent. And uh, I am behind this man 100%. I heard somebody say one time, I'm 110% behind you, and that's just not possible. So I'm not going to stand here and lie. I'm behind you 100%. I appreciate his love for our apostolic identity. I appreciate his love for this doctrine. I appreciate his passion for apostolic revival. And he is leading our district into the next realm of church growth from the north to the south, east to the west. And we're honored to have him here in Creve Court in section 9 tonight to speak and to preach to us on this dedication night. Would you put your hands together and welcome our district superintendent. Church, 
you may not see it. I don't want to embarrass you, but uh, I want to know who I'm preaching to you because this is about you tonight. And everyone else has come to worship with you, but I want to know as I'm preaching who the local church is as well. And uh, pray for me tonight. I've been dealing with some sinus issues and never had your ears where you feel like you're in a barrel and all those things. And so it's, it's not been pleasant. And so if I, uh, my voice or my head does something really goofy, I just forgive me. Thomas Jefferson said this. He said, we must all hang together or assuredly we shall all hang separate. Wow. Right. Wow. We must all hang together or assuredly we shall all hang separately. This was said at the signing of the Declaration of Independence. It was a new day. They said, everything that's led up to this day, what we're doing today changes everything. And if we don't stick together, we're going to have to stick together because the enemy right. is not going to be happy with what we're doing today. That's right. right. That's right. And the enemy is going to fight. That's right. right. That's and right. the enemy is going to attack. That's right. Amen. So I've come to say to this local church to start out together, you must all hang together. Or assuredly you will all hang separately. Because the enemy does not like it when a church progresses in any shape or form. And just when you sign to say, we're going to expand our territory, we're going to expand our sanctuary, all of hell yes, sir. wants to attack yes, sir. somebody saying that we're thankful for everything that's brought us to today, right. but we're going forward. Yes. Great things are going to happen as we go forward. You see, there is a strategy that is called this. It's called divine and calm. Uh -huh. It's a strategy designed to break the power of unity because if a group can be separated or disgruntlement can begin, if infighting can start, the group is much easier to conquer than if they are united together. Generals observed throughout history that it is easier to defeat one army of 50,000 men followed by another army of 50,000 men rather than to fight against one army of 100,000 men. The numbers might seem the same, but there is a difference. And they understood if we can divide this into two chunks, we will be more successful. And because of, of, of the importance of unity and the power that comes when we are linked together, and right. so there's always been this principle of battle and warfare to try to divide and to conquer. You see, if we expose ourselves to the enemy, when one is face to face with the enemy and, and another and the, are back to back, we, we can unite in the purpose of what is taking place. Right. There have never been two fiercer warriors in all of American history than a Apache chief by the name of Geronimo and his counterparts, chief known as Crazy Horse. They will ever, forever be known and recognized for really ancient, what we would call guerrilla warfare in history. Crazy Horse will forever be remembered as the strategist who outflanked, divided, and then slaughtered the entire 7th Cavalry of the U.S. Army, what was under the command of one General Armstrong Custer that has forever been known as Custer's last stand. He outflanked, divided, separated him from the group, and then destroyed him. And the military, crazy, became sort of their most, uh, America's most wanted, I guess, back in ancient days. And yet they never could track him down. He was an expert at hiding. He was an expert at deception. And so finally the military gave up. They no longer tried to just track him down and out strategize him what they began to do is they began to give food and supplies and horses and other articles to other Indians and in turn it was other Indians that led our US Army to eventually be able to take crazy horse divide and conquer we could not do it without dividing through 
getting some horses, getting some things to allow us to have that access. This is a principle we see in so many areas. In fact, if you're a parent, <laughs> what military geniuses have tried to accomplish throughout centuries, children perfect within the first few years of their life. <laughs> they know how to come to one parent. And, uh, they never go to mom and dad at the same time. Children never go. They understand, I will go to one, and if I can get one just to even waffle, if I can get one parent just to say even maybe, then I can go to the other parent and say, hey, mom doesn't care if you don't care. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. And when mom and dad get in the car, they find out that a five-year-old has outsmarted them and outwitted them because he divided them and conquered both of them. Yeah. Right. That if they would have been together, this is why in families and in marriages, it is critical right. that mom and dad are on the same page. Right. Because if mom and dad are not on the same page, the entire family becomes splinter right. and divided. Right. And so it is a principle that takes place throughout yes, history, sir. continues today. Israel came to superpower status under the rule of David. A status that continued to grow and was established under the rule of Solomon, his son. Solomon inherited a great deal of goodwill just because David was his father. David was an incredible king. In fact, the flag of David still flies over Israel to this day, recognized as their greatest king. Right. And when Solomon assumed the throne, he, had a, he inherited a great deal of goodwill and good favor because of David. David had focused on expanding Israel militarily. He was ensuring their national security. He continued to take lands and spread out their territory. He was one who lived by the sword. Solomon, though, when he came to rule, it was a time of peace. And Solomon began to focus on the infrastructure and began to establish their infrastructure to build the cities. He began to build the temple of God, which David had wanted to do, but the Lord had forbidden him to do it because he was a man of war. And Solomon began to establish this. And, and uh, to, uh, but however, in the process, as time goes on, we see that there's a change, a shift that takes place in Solomon's life. And he begins to place heavy burdens on, on the people, taxing them excessively. Solomon was pursuing in his desire to establish Israel, it went beyond his trust of Jehovah. And he began to form alliances with other nations through the age-old practices of marrying into the families of competing nations. And as a result, part of Israel's growing and expanding in their infrastructure were new temples that were built that were dedicated to a variety of gods and, and idols that would take place. And under Solomon, he hired a shrewd builder whose name was Jeroboam to assist him in establishing the infrastructure. Jeroboam was initially uh, uh, hired to build the terraces and fill in uh, the gaps in the walls of the city of David. And Solomon was so impressed with Jer Jeroboam's good work that he hired him and elevated him until eventually Jeroboam began to run the entire labor force of the house of Joseph, the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. And he was in a place of prestige, his skill, his ability, uh, the excellence with which he did his work. He became noticed from a blue collar, common labor, until he elevated to where soon he is one of the, the most respected people in all of the nation of Israel. And as time goes back by, Solomon drifts farther and farther from the Lord until he becomes a tyrant and oppressive of the people. And Jeroboam experienced the effect, and he saw the effect of Solomon's rule upon the nation's workers and how hard it was. And he started to plant the seeds of rebellion to try to divide and then conquer. However, Solomon still had enough loyalty and power to overthrow the rebellion, placing a death sentence on Jeroboam's life. And Jeroboam fled uh, fle fle from Israel and and went to Egypt in order to spare his life because Solomon still had enough favor and goodwill, even though he was a tyrant, but there was still an honor and respect that went back to David. All right. And so Solomon continued on until his death. And when he died, his son Rehoboam ascended to the throne in an attempt to solidify his position on the throne. He heeded some very bad advice. 
He informed an already disgruntled nation that he was going to increase their burden. He, he let them know that he, if you think Solomon put heavy loads upon you, you just wait. What, what Solomon put on you is just a fraction right. of the load that I'm going to put on you. Please stay with me just for the next few moments yes, as I lay a foundation. Yes, sir. And the goodwill that Solomon possessed due to David's reign was gone by the time we get to Rehoboam. Israel became a divided nation. Yeah. It separated into a northern kingdom of ten tribes and a southern kingdom of two. Yeah. And all of a sudden, throughout the rest of time, you have uh, in the scriptures, you refer to Israel as the northern tribes and Judah as the southern part. It is a divided nation. You see, when this took place, Israel, Jeroboam, has, was sent for in Egypt immediately following Solomon's death. And, and he comes, and the reason is, is he's the leader of the people. The people respect him. They, they know his work. They know his skill. They know his wisdom. And, and he leads the contingent to Rehoboam to plead for mercy. And he had the heart of the people. And yet, they call for him because Rehoboam would not listen. And they anoint him to be king over Israel, over the ten tribes. And so now, for the first time in history since God has had a nation, since the time that Israel led them out of Egypt, for the first time ever, God's people are completely divided. There's been conflicts, there's been family squabbles throughout the years, I understand that. But for the first time, it is divided to where there are two kings now. There's Jeroboam and there's Rehoboam, and they are at odds. And Jeroboam, true to his nature, true to his wisdom and his understanding and and uh, the, the, the strategic way in which he, he thought and acted. He began to establish an infrastructure in the northern Israel. He began to do what he had always done. He began to fortify their defenses because he knows it's not long until Judah is going to get the military. And they're going to come, and I'm a builder. We're going to fortify this northern part of Israel. We're going to build our cities and our defenses. And this is where I get to my text tonight. It's 1 Kings, the 12th chapter, verse 25. Therefore the king asked advice and made two calves of gold and said to the people, It is too much for you to go up to, Israel, uh, go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you out from the land of Egypt. He set one in Bethel and he put the other in Dan. And this thing became a sin. The people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. He made shrines on the high places and made priests from every class of the people who are not of the sons of Levi. Jeroboam ordained a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month. Like the feast that was in Judah, offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did at Bethel sacrificing to the calves he had made. And at Bethel he installed priests of the high place which he had made. See, Jeroboam is a strategist. He recognizes that although the people are disgruntled, Although they are divided, they reacted to Rehoboam in anger because it has been building over the years and the, the, the temperature is high. He understood as time goes on, our temperature sort of, we begin to settle down. We see this happen daily in the United States of America. Something can happen and now we have what we call a 24-hour news cycle. 24 hours because... America and the public can be outraged at something. And yet a few days later, it's drifted away. There's something about human nature that we can be upset and passionate, but give it a few days and hey, yeah, we were upset then, it was a big deal then, but we'll just go along with it anyway. Yeah. 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 And Jeroboam understood that while they're angry and they've been divided, what has happened is the northern tribes have been divided from the house of God. They've been divided from the temple. And the temple is in Jerusalem. And when their anger begins to die down, they're going to remember the glory days of David's reign. They're going to remember their connection and their heritage and the temple that Solomon built. And they're going to begin to go back to Jerusalem and back to the house of God. And when they go back to the house of God and they begin to worship, their hearts will once again be reunited with their brothers. And, and they will become one again. And then I'll be back in the same condition I was at before. I will have to flee for my life. 
So Jeroboam, who's no fool, strategically understands that if I want to keep people from going to the house of God, I'm going to have to do something to keep them in the northern part of Israel. I, I, the, the feast and the festivals that they're used to going to worship, when it comes festival time, all of a sudden, when they're uh, a few weeks out from youth convention or camp meeting or something there, they're going to start saying, oh man, all of our lives we went to the house of God. All of our lives we made that journey, that trek to Jerusalem. And they're going to start packing their bags and, and they're going to go. And so here's what Jeroboam began to do. He says, you know what? I want to make things a little bit more convenient for you than it was. You remember how difficult it was during Solomon's reign and and you know what Rehoboam is doing. And here's, here's what I want to do. I want to make it a little easier for you. You don't have to go all the way back to Jerusalem. You don't have to go all the way back to the house of God. Let, let's make things more convenient. Let, let's set up an idol in Dan. And let's set up an idol in Beersheba. We'll have one in the north and one in the south. You don't have to go back to that one place of worship anymore. Well, why make the trek to just one place? Well, what's the big deal with having a place? I don't know what the big deal is. Why do you always have to go to the same place? Why, why can't we have more options? Huh. And he fired the authentic priesthood of the Levites and he said, you know what? When it goes back to the law, it goes back to Solomon, and going all the way back to Moses, uh, you know what? It, it, was, it was very specific, really intolerant. We want to open up the priesthood. All right. Well, we want more people to be priests and have an opportunity to be yeah. priests and and they might not have the qualifications as specified in the law, but hey, you know what? They're, they're a little too narrow-minded anyway. Let's open things up a little bit. But let, let's allow, hey, you always want to be a priest? Why don't you be a priest as well? I think you'll make a good priest. Yeah. Yeah. He started to ordain new feasts and new festivals at different periods in the calendar year in order to replace the established traditions that the elders Going all the way back and established that were connected to the acts of a living God. Right. He says, let's, let's institute brand new things. Those are old anyway. We go through the same motions all the time. Every time we go, the Feast of Tabernacles, of Busa, of First Fruits, we're going through the same thing all the time. Yeah. Let, let's shake it up a little bit. Yeah. Let's have something new. Let, let's get cutting edge. We, we live in a world where everybody around us is a little bit more cutting edge than we are. Right. Maybe yeah. we could incorporate a few things. And then, you know, he still connected it to their national identity. Here, let me read this, this verse. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now listen to this verse. This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now it sounds like the same verse. But it's two different verses. One is in 1 Kings. It's the words of Jeroboam. One is in Exodus. When Aaron shaped a golden cow that was really connected to Egyptian idolatry. Right. And said, this is the God. You see, understand. He wasn't saying a different God. He's saying, this is Jehovah. This golden cow. This is the God. This is, this is Jehovah that brought you out of, out of the land. And here, all of a sudden, Jeroboam is reconnecting and saying, this is the God. We know from the Word of God, man, there's only one person, one image of Him, and it was never to be a golden calf. It was to be Jesus Christ, the image of the invisible God. And anything that will be portrayed as God outside of Jesus will be a horrible sin. And Jeroboam tried to take ancient cultic practices and somehow tie it back to their history and their heritage. And notice this. It was all these actions that kept Israel originally from going to the promised land in the first place. Here's what George Santiago is known for saying that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. You see, tragically, there are too many that continue to be separated from truth and a right relationship with God and His body, the church. Things happen in life, and this is where I want to preach now for just a few more moments. Things happen in 
life that bring uh, bring an incident divide us from the body, from the church, or from the pastor. All right. It might be a real, it might be perceived. Some incident happened, and whether it's real or perceived, it's allowed to take root in our lives, and pretty soon it becomes a wedge between us and our brothers and sisters, the church, our pastor, those that are in our lives. Listen to me, saints of God, you might have a legitimate complaint. Your pastor may have made a mistake. I'm standing here today. It's amazing to me that there are some of those who think pastors don't make mistakes. I make so many mistakes, it's incredible. I make so many mistakes, I don't know, I'm no longer even have to apologize to the church I pastor. Because they're so accustomed to it. <laughs> Just another mistake. So you know what, there are times I make mistakes. I might be believing, light on it a little bit. But there are times, my personality, I, I get focused on something and I'm not paying attention to how I say it. And it comes across wrong. Uh, it comes across uh, mean or angry. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm just somewhere else. I'm very focused on whatever the next box is. I've got to check off. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And my wife will say, honey, you, 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 you were a little too, too fast. You, 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 didn't, you, you look like maybe you were upset. Or, or maybe your, your words came across wrong. And I have to go back and apologize. It's not, that's not what I meant. And understand that, that if somebody wants to find an issue with me, it will not take you long. <laughs> Some of y'all are saying amen because you've already thought, thought of a couple of things. <laughs> you've already thought of a couple of things. And so we make mistakes. Well, let me say this with smile. You know what? Sometimes a complaint is not legitimate. All right. Right. Sometimes it's how we perceive something. Right, right, right. You see, life didn't turn out the way you planned. Or folks have thought, surely I would be much farther along than I am right now. Things aren't just going the way I want it to be. You know what I've noticed is frequently we want people to forgive and forget right. our mistakes, right. our careless words our wrong attitude. The time we let somebody else down. We want them to forgive us, to show us grace and mercy, but we often hold on to what others do with a death grip. Uh -huh. right. I, I know, I know, I know, but that's different. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Come on, that's now. different. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's what happens in our lives. Uh, uh, you know, there, it, it comes down that, that we want and desperately want people to forgive. In fact, there's an error. It's called the fundamental attribution error. This is going to be great. Fundamental attribution error. And here's what the fundamental attribution error is. The fundamental attribution error says that when I take my four-year-old to the, the grocery store, and we're going through the grocery store, and I see your kid rolling around on the ground, Screaming and yelling and spitting because you won't give them a Snickers bar. <laughs> I look at you and say, what a brat. And what horrible parents. Why don't these parents get this kid under control? <laughs> but when my kid is rolling around well, on the ground screaming and spitting because he doesn't get a Snickers bar, well, I say, well, he just didn't get his nap in today. <laughs> He's just tired. The fundamental attribution error is that when it comes to us, we always have a good reason that it is, it is the environment with us. But with other people, it is their character. Yeah. 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 Wow. That's good. You see, a lot of what happens in churches and starts causing division in churches is not the devil. Sometimes it's our own personalities and our own issues and our own yes. perceptions. And, and we're not getting along with one another. And you know what it does? All of those things can be a wedge. Yes. Right. Yes, sir. It starts to divide. Yes, sir. Well, my father's from Northeast Mississippi. My grandfather, when he was in his 80s, they wrote him up in the paper, showed the picture, front page of the paper, because in, in his 80s, he still did not have, and this is, you think this is out here, Northeast Mississippi in July, 
and all of those months. He still did not have anything but a fan, no heat but a fireplace. And he still, in his 80s, split his own wood. Split his own wood. I, I'm telling you, the man, uh, my grandfather, just, uh, I don't know, wasn't very tall, wiry, but he would put one of those, what they call a backlog, on his hip that, that we were struggling even to, to move. And what he would do, there were some times when the trees would come down, it was too big just to, just to divide with an axe. And so what he had, he had a tool that was called a wedge. And no matter how big it was, if you could try a wedge into it and pound a wedge into it, it would not be very long until regardless of the size, it would split in half. Because once a wedge gets involved in it, it can split anything no matter how big it is.
said, yeah, we don't have an Ark of the Covenant just like that. We've got, we've got some gold and stuff, and it's really cool. It's new. You never worshiped at something like this. Not only a substitute was made for the house of God, you don't have to go back to Jerusalem. It's more convenient. Yeah. And the Ark of the Covenant, even the feast, traditional feasts and observances of the acts of God that were instituted by God through Moses were changed. The Feast of Tabernacles, for instance, was instructed by the Lord to be held on the seventh month. It was instituted by God to take place immediately following the harvest. They would be thankful for how they had been blessed and how God had blessed the nation. It was a memorial of the wilderness wanderings and the celebration of the harvest. It so happened that if you go back in history, you'll find out it was on that occasion that Solomon dedicated the temple. And it was on that occasion that the glory of the Lord came down and the fire of the Lord consumed the sacrifice. The glory of the Lord came down and filled the house of God and the priest could not minister because of the power of the glory of the Lord. That is what happened on that day. And Jeroboam designed a feast on the very same day, except he just moved it back We'll go from the seventh, we'll put it back on the eighth month. We're still going to do a lot of the same things. And you see what happens is once your adversary gets you from the house of God, soon he'll even have a change in the feasts and activities. And what was this festival about? Is what it was about being thankful that God provided for us. Right. This is why money, and just, just to take a side note, this is why money is talked about so much in Scripture. Uh -huh. Because money is a spiritual thermometer. Uh, right. Preacher, how can you talk about money so much? I, I guarantee you that there's not a preacher alive that talks about money as much as Jesus did. That's All right. right. That's yeah. right. Exactly right. <laughs> I guarantee you. But what was this about? It was about God's blessed us and we want to bring first fruits and we want to show our favor to the Lord. And you see what happens is, yeah. is once God starts putting that wedge, it'll start with the house of God. It'll start with our relationship to God. He also established a new priesthood. One that was not made up of the Levites that God had chosen. You see, this is this is what goes on in this world. Pretty soon you'll be thinking, you know what, I need somebody new to speak in my life. That guy on the radio. Oh, come on. I, I'll have him or that guy on the internet. Listen very carefully. The internet is not a place to do your spiritual research and get your spiritual guidance. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. God never intended the internet to be that place. Right. We live in a time and a place where people are even discounting the house of God altogether. Yeah. Right. We live in a time and a place where people are wanting to resurrect the house church movement. Yeah. And say we'll just meet at Starbucks at a coffee yeah. shop. Come on now. Yeah. We'll read a few passages of scriptures. You tell me what it means to you. Uh -huh. I'll tell you what it means to me. Uh, we'll just talk about it a little bit, and then we've had church. Uh, there you go. You know what this was rooted in? This is rooted in a rebellious movement yes, to sir. bring a division, to separate people from a spiritual authority and a man of God in their life. Right. right. Wow. wow. Very good. good. <laughs> you see, it was not a preacher that said, we need, we need preachers. Right. Mm -hmm. It was God that said, I am my church that I'm going to build. I am putting in apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists yeah. for the perfecting of the saints. It was God that said, I want a man of God in my life. And what the devil wants to do is separate you from a true man of God in your life. Right. You know why I'm a preacher? No, I'm a preacher. It's not because I took a gift survey at high school in career counseling. And it just popped up. Preacher. And it's not what happened. At East Aurora High School where I went to career counseling. And they didn't say, you know what, we check your gifts and we don't know this deep testing of you. And we, we see that your leanings are to, to be a preacher. 
Mm. God started dealing with me when I was 16 years old. Yeah. This is going to date me. It's, it's a June conference going back. <laughs> Brother Merle Yui was preaching. And he had this idea that the United Pentecostal Church, everybody should have 6 o'clock in the morning prayer. Honestly. And his, he preached this. This was from the general conference floor. And that if every church is preaching and praying at 6 a.m., that means all around the world, because of the different time zones, there will be 24 hours of continued prayer by the United Pentecostal Church. Right. And I was feeling this happen in my life to the degree, this is really going to take me, that I would get up in the morning before I went to school. <laughs> I'm fixing to lose all of the young people right now. <laughs> I would get my little boom box. <laughs> Does anybody remember what a boom box is? Some of y'all. I know you either slept through that decade or you just don't remember. It came after the eight track and after the cassette. It had a little hand on the speakers on it, and I would take that to our church, and I had my prayer tape. And it was over this space about four or five months that that I knew without a shadow of a doubt. I, I knew it before, but I kept praying. I, I wanted to make sure this was not me, it was not my flesh, but I knew without a doubt that God, God called me Hallelujah. to preach the gospel. I, I remember my sister-in-law telling somebody she worked with, man, my, my nephew's been called to preach. And, and it was so amazing to her, she said, well, well who called him? And in her mind, somebody, you know what, maybe St. Louis or some headquarters, somewhere got on the phone and said, you have been drafted. Your number has come up. You're going to be a preacher. But that's not how it happened because that's not how it has ever happened in the history of the kingdom of God. It was God that said, I want men who without fear and without fear will stand behind the desk and will say, thus says the Lord. And you need somebody in your life that's not afraid
I know this is really different for a church dedication. But this is the word of the Lord tonight. Is as as we go forward to what God is wanting to do, I want you to know the enemy and flesh and personalities and all these things are going to rise up. Yeah, they are. Right. And if you're looking for the perfect church, please don't go. Because you would mess it up. But the fact is, is there's no room for a thought. Where we get this mindset, I, I have no idea. It, it's got to be from Hollywood or this was somewhere. Because there's never been a perfect church. Two-thirds of our New Testament deals with church problems. Yeah, that's right. right. Some pretty intense church problems. But through it all, there are going to be problems. There are going to be disagreements. There are going to be personality conflicts. There are going to be spiritual attacks. But as long as we stay united, as long as we are united together, as long as we refuse to be divided, as long as we say, you know what? As I come to a close, please be careful, parents. Throughout the scripture, there are over a dozen references to the sins of Jeroboam. Because once instituted, the compromise became a stumbling block that conquered many Israelites for generations. Scripture will record that future kings would have. I will be guilty of the sins of Jeroboam. In fact, even during times of great revival, for instance, with Jacob, he's the one that called for Jezebel to be thrown down. Would be the dogs that would consume him. He would destroy temples and altars and false prophets of Baal. However, the Bible would say, yet stop short. Of getting rid of the sins of Jeroboam. Here's what 2 Kings 10 29 says Jehu did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabal, who made Israel sin, that is, from the golden calves that were Bethlehem. Because once you go that far, even when you want to come back, it's very hard right. to get all the way back. Right. Right. Please listen to me right now. Once a wedge has divided you from your pastor and your church, I see this all the time, and bitterness and other things get in our life. And even when we feel that we need to come back, I've seen people make strides. There's something about our flesh and our pride and our ego and other things. It is very hard to get all the way back to that state of submission right. and authority that was once in our life. We might start taking up some of the feasts that we used to. We might start praising and clapping and worshiping like we used to. But sometimes, even though people have come a long way back, there's still some wedge inside. They've been unable to come. And that's why you have got to make sure in your life that you don't let anything bring that division. This is a new day. This is a new house. This is going forward in the name of Jesus. Great things are going to happen. But along the way, you mark my words on this line. Something's going to happen. And it'll either be real and you're right, you were done wrong. Or you're wrong, it's your perception. Either way, it's as real to you regardless. Yeah. If it's real or if it's a misperception in your heart. It's real, and you are done. And you've got to make up your mind right now. That's what that preacher told me. Was going to and I can do one of two things. I can take care of this right now and say, I'm not going to let this wedge bury deep inside me. That will eventually divide me where I can be conquered by the adversary who is as a roaring lion seeking who he made the battle. But I'm going to deal with it right now. Because this is how it starts. 
It won't be long if I let this wedge in here that I'll be getting angry and bitter and pretty soon I'll start missing the house of God. Pretty soon I'll start I'll start withholding my tithes and offering. Pretty soon I'll stop it, I'll stop I'll start ignoring the phone calls from the preacher and brothers and sisters and I'll isolate myself and then one day I'll wake up and I'll look up at a church where there is no mercy seat where it might look familiar they might clap their hands like they did at the house of God they might even wave their hands and their music might sound similar but there is no Shekinah there is no presence there is no mercy seat you see they might they might baptize but it won't be in the name of Jesus and, and they might talk about the spirit of God but it won't be speaking with other tongues and it'll look familiar and similar but there won't Jesus Christ comes back for his church. You're going to need more than a form of worship. You're going to need the power of the Holy Ghost to be deep inside of you. Hallelujah. I wonder if we could stand tonight. I've come to preach what's been on my heart. And as you go into a new day, can I tell you, there's not a devil in hell that can stop you. Can. Can. But you know, and I'm going to be honest, I hope this is not taken wrong, because I really believe in the devil, and I know there's spiritual warfare, and I believe in all of it. Prayer, and every aspect of spiritual warfare, I am a believer. There's spirits, there's wickedness, there's powers. I believe that. But when it comes to the local church where I'm pastor, I'm more worried about flesh, and personalities, and conflicts, and human spirits. Because when we go to prayer, we can bind them. We can overcome him by the blood of the Lamb in the name of Jesus Christ. But when two brothers get crossways with one another, where somebody gets upset with me and there's a wedge that I can't remove, the devil just has to step back and let our bitterness, our pride, and our flesh take over. And pretty soon we've separated ourselves where it's not even a difficult thing for the devil to destroy our lives. And so tonight, this is the house of God. Amen. This is the man of God. These are the people of God. What we're doing tonight it's a celebration of God. And Christmas is going to come, and Easter is going to come, and Pentecost is going to come, and our feasts, and our festivals, and our customs, and our traditions. And don't let anybody, or anything, or any spirit, or any perceived wrong cause you to have a wedge to divide you from this house, from this man, from these people, from this book. From this truth, from this heart, in Jesus' name, can we lift our hands to Him? Jesus.
for a man, a heart searching voice of warning preparation you keep Jesus at the center it's really hard for anything to get in between you and the church right. be seated for just a moment we're going to go into the dedication of this building the word dedicate simply means that we will allow the holiness of God to inundate, impact, and influence a person or a place. In other words, to initiate or set on the right course or the right track. This was an existing building. And I'm not casting stones at the former denomination that was represented here. But tonight, we're going to set some things on the right track going forward. When we talk about the dedication of God's temple, it included three things. It included the past. If you study in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, David, uh, or Solomon, brought in all the things of his father that David had set aside for the temple. Also, the ark, the tablets of the covenant. I think that represents tonight what the previous generations have stood for, what they have believed in, what they have sacrificed for. And tonight, obviously, as a part of this church, this local assembly, is the pastor emeritus and his wife, Reverend Mrs. Eugene Talbot, who pastored here from 1971 until the year 2000. And I think it would just be fitting if we would put our hands together in appreciation to Reverend and Mrs. Eugene Talbot. Pastor Emeritus for 29 years. Yeah, that's good. 29 years of service and sacrifice, blood, sweat, tears, prayers, passion, compassion for the lost. So as we go forward, Pastor Talbot, we can never forget the past. We will honor the past. You may be seated as we celebrate going forward. And just as David or Solomon remembered what David had done we got to remember what our elders have stood for, believed in, and sacrificed for. It also represented the present because in that time, Solomon blessed the entire congregation. So tonight, we also are thankful for those that are presently a part of this church because obviously, we wouldn't be here tonight if it were not for you and your sacrifice and your love for truth and your love for for lost souls. We thank God for Pastor and Sister Tat Ron Talbot, who have been pastor of this local assembly since the year 2000. I think it'd be good to give them a hand and let them know how much we love and appreciate them as well. But we are not stuck in the past and we are not stuck here in the present but there's a future that we are concerned with there is going to be trouble our bishop preached to us preparing us for it there will be trouble there will be war there will be famine but when we allow our worship to focus upon the highs and the lows then we'll have a roller coaster relationship we need to let our eyes and our ears and our heart be towards this place Attend to the prayer that is made in this place. Attend to the worship that is conducted in this place. There were so many things about that, that temple that I don't have time to go into tonight. When we think about the ark, which represents the presence of the Spirit of God. When we look at the spirit of sacrifice and the offerings that were given in order to build that tabernacle. The spirit of worship represented by the singers and the instruments and the exaltation of God in 2 Chronicles 6 and 14. There are so many things that go into making this not just a building and not just a structure, but it makes it the house of God, where the God of this house is always in control. Tonight we look at places within this facility that we will dedicate it to the Lord. First and foremost, this platform and this pulpit, which represent the leadership of this church. 
You got a pastor that is vibrant and passionate about this apostolic truth and reaching free core with this message. Follow him as he follows God. This altar, which represents a place of dedication and commitment and prayer. The instruments and the, and the choir area, which represents the music that will be played and sung unto our holy God. The sound room back there. Thank God for apostolic sound people that understand what a preacher means when he's in the pulpit. I needed at least two amens from back here. There we go. Envision in the future there's going to be a little reconstruction. And we're going to have a baptismal tank. Right. Where we won't have to drive over. And we thank God for the purity of the church. But we won't have to drive over. Maybe we're just going to drive here. Amen? Amen? We're going to dedicate that future to the Lord. And the foyer, which represents our ministries and our outreach and welcoming people that they will feel at home the moment they, they step into this place. The prayer room. We can't forsake and forget the prayer room. Right. Because as a church prays, will determine how a church goes and grows. The auditorium and the pews, don't they feel comfortable? They represent the church and the laity. So I am going to ask if the members of this local assembly would stand and join me in the altar area. Would you come and do that tonight? Pastor and Sister Talbot, I would ask if you would stand in the very front center facing me. That would be great. And if you, I don't want to confuse anybody when I said members of this local church, if this is where you attend, then when you go to church, this is where you attend. I want you to come as well. Feel free to do so. Would the rest of the church stand and uh, support this moment? Tonight, Pastor Talbot, a vision and a dream. I know you've already been in this place for a while, but we're letting this be the focal point tonight. It's become a reality. A place that you prayed over, prayed about, heard from God, and now God has placed it into your hands. So we dedicate this house to the worship of the one true and living God, to the service of our blessed Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We dedicate this house tonight to the preaching of the gospel, of the grace and the mercy of God, who is able to save from the uttermost to the uttermost, and for salvation that is full and free to whosoever will. We dedicate this house tonight to the instruction and training of all ages in the way of righteousness and holiness and for proper growth in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Yes. Preparing for every spiritual activity and service. I expect to hear these Sunday school classes filled to overflow. Because great Sunday schools make great churches. This place is dedicated for the training and the nurture of childhood, for the inspiration and admonition for our youth and for the sanctification of the family for strength and comfort of the aged, for the help of the needy, for every good work. We dedicate this house to prayer. We dedicate this house to worship in prayer and song. We dedicate this house to the ministry of the word. And we dedicate this house to the service of the saints, to the glory and the will of God. First Kings chapter 8, verse 27 through 30 reads, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have built. Yet have thou respect unto the prayer of thy servant and to his supplication. O Lord my God, to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee today, that thine eyes may be open toward this house, night and day, even toward the place of which thou hast said, My name shall be there. That thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place. And hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant and of thy people Israel. When they shall pray toward this place. And hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place. When thou hearest, forgive. 
So at this point, I am going to say a few things, and then I will ask this congregation to together declare we dedicate this house. To the worship of the one true and living God, to the service of our blessed Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We dedicate this house. To the preaching of the gospel of the grace of God, who is able to save. We dedicate this house. To instruct Christians in the way of righteousness and holiness for proper growth. We dedicate this house. For worship in prayer and song, for the ministry of word, and for the training, inspiration, and sanctification. We dedicate this house. Now in the presence of God and these witnesses, we dedicate this house in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We dedicate this house, its furnitures, its instruments and equipment, all of it together to God for his service. And in doing so, we present ourselves, our body and soul and spirit to God and humbly pray we may acceptably serve and worship God here. Would you join me in lifting our hands as we pray this prayer now in the presence of God. Lord Jesus, the witnesses that are in this house tonight, the word is gone forth. But we dedicate this house in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We dedicate everything about this house from the top to the bottom, from the front to the back. We dedicate it for the service of our God. We present ourselves humbly before you and ask that you will accept our service and our worship unto you. We're asking you, Lord, who is the giver of all good gifts, that you will graciously accept the offering of this house in the name of Jesus, both for your glory and for the good of all concerned. I'm asking, Lord Jesus, that you'll bless every heart which shares in the gift that is made by the willing hands and the grateful hearts that has brought us to this night. I ask you, God, to let this place be a beacon, a light that will shine out throughout the city of Greekport. I'm asking you, God, in your precious name, that you will draw sinners, that you will draw the hurting and the helpless and the hopeless to a place where truth is preached, where there is hope that can transform their life. I pray for a fresh anointing upon Pastor Talbot. Every time he steps in this pulpit, let his lips be anointed for the cause of the altar of heaven. Let him preach with apostolic authority and boldness, but let him preach with love and mercy and grace that will reach every part of this city. I praise you for a people that are going to bind together behind their pastor as he leads them into the next realm of an apostolic outpouring of your spirit. Lord, I'm asking you to fill this house up. I'm asking you, God, to fill it up with hungry people that are willing to accept your word. In the name of Jesus, we give you the praise. Would you put your hands together and lift your voices? Here's an oldie, and I think it fits right here. Can we just lift our hands? Not just this building, but every person in this place. Can we sing it?
congregation before I turn it back to your pastor. I just remind you, every time you walk into this building, you are walking into the house of God. There is a sacred place, but a safe place. A place of refuge and a place of worship. God bless you. Congratulations on this new building. One more time, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise and pass it down. that's been left behind. And I've heard stories about the, the woman that started this church. Anything that was loose, you better watch it because it would become unloose. I read a, an article just today that before she met in a house here with some folks and they had a prayer meeting. Then there was a seven-day revival that ensued, and then the church was birthed. She pastored here for many years, and, and I was thinking, you know, how the history of this little whitewashed building, and it's been through three remodels before we got it. And then I was thinking of how the presence of the Lord, they would talk about, fill the, this house. But something happened. And I've talked to my, on my people. I preached to them. Because when you lose the glory, you lose the presence of God. And then all you have is a social Sharing the word. Brother Corthrop, I don't want to lose the glory. I don't want to lose his presence. And the only way we may obtain it and hang on to it is declare truth. Preach truth. I love truth. And I want other people to love truth as much as I love truth. There's only one way. One way. One way. Hallelujah. Jesus said. That he was the door. And he proclaimed himself as the one way. No other way. That's right. Hallelujah. And I thank God for the new birth experience. Yes, and I believe it. Yes, sir. You must repent of your sin. Yeah. Be baptized in the only name. Right. And what is his name? Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then the the Holy Spirit is given. You can, you shall be fed. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And thank you, pastors and you saints that's come and help celebrate this occasion tonight. Hallelujah. And as we're dismissed from this place, uh, all of you ministers, uh, in the fellowship hall next door, we have a uh, reception for you if you want to stay and enjoy and uh, enjoy with us. And uh, let's just lift our hands one more time. Let's love the Lord. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your presence in this place. Lord, thank you for your anointing. Thank you, Lord, for your ministry that proclaims and upholds truth. And Lord, as we dismiss from this place tonight, we ask that your traveling mercies be with every family, every church, every pastor. 
we just give you praise in that awesome and mighty name. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Power. Great is your power, great is your strength. 